This video is sponsored by Longevity Technology. It is more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where as reflected in that famous quote by Hippocrates, we'll be taking a look in this video at precision medicine and the promises of improving health by accounting for individual variability in genes, environment and lifestyle. In particular, we'll be focusing on seven opportunities that can accelerate precision medicine, as reflected in this recent commentary article in Cell, and discuss how this can be applied to individuals to help them improve their health for as long as possible. But we'll also take a look at some of the challenges still ahead, and how those challenges can be tackled. So first then, what is precision medicine? Well, it will help to give an example. Last year, the National Institutes of Health Nutrition Research Task Force announced that they had initiated a strategic plan for 2030 for achieving precision nutrition. And this is the idea that answering the question, what should we eat to stay healthy, is not a very simple question to answer. And this is because the answer is not a one size fits all. And each of us have individual dietary responses. And so Precision Nutrition is aiming to provide individualised, actionable dietary recommendations that can help us to decide what, when, why and how to eat to optimise our health and quality of life. So extending the same principles back to Precision Medicine, the aims of Precision Medicine is to be able to refine diagnoses, provide more rational treatment options, with the overall aim in preventing diseases. And this is reflected in the name precision medicine, with higher precision referring to the fact that more relevant results are achieved than irrelevant ones. Although I do hope that it's also accurate, not just precise. And so you may have also come across this term as personalised medicine. But they all pretty much mean the same thing, tailoring the input and output data to an individual. So what will it take to achieve precision medicine by 2030? Well, in this recent article, there are seven key opportunities that are outlined as we'll now discuss. The first opportunity are the development of huge longitudinal cohorts. And so this is to build upon the work that's already been conducted over the last two decades, including national cohorts, such as the UK Biobank and the All of Us research program that have generated these huge populations with genomic, laboratory and lifestyle assessments, as well as longitudinal follow-ups on health outcomes. And so basically, there's already a wealth of information that's already out there. But to make this data more accessible, what's really needed are ways in which all of the information from these different cohorts can be merged together to make it easier for different researchers to access. And so this would involve the development of common data models and file formats to facilitate collaboration and interoperability. But the good news is that efforts are already being undertaken to improve this process, such as work conducted by the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. The second opportunity is improved diversity and inclusion in science. And so shockingly, less than 3% of the participants in published genome-wide association studies are of African, Hispanic or Latin American ancestries, and 86% of clinical trial participants are white. So there is much room for improvement, which is very much needed if we can reduce the risks of exacerbating health disparities. Moreover, by improving diversity in these studies, it will enable better biological discoveries. And as stated in this article, it extends from just the involvement in research studies, but also to improve the diversity of the biomedical research workforce, as with a more diverse workforce in culture, ancestry, beliefs, scientific backgrounds and methodological approaches, it will improve the understanding, innovation, trust and cultural sensitivity with the ultimate aim of delivering better research, which I think we can all agree is of highest priority. So the third opportunity is big data and artificial intelligence. And if you've read Eric Topol's book, Deep Medicine, you'll know that artificial intelligence is going to be so important for integrating all of these big data sets in terms of delivering precision medicine. And out of these different artificial intelligence approaches, Deep machine learning and deep neural networks will play an important role in being able to integrate the different layers of information that can be gathered for each individual. And so as you can see in the schematic of a deep neural network taken from Eric's book, there are multiple different input layers that can be taken from an individual. And by integrating this information into a deep neural network, it can provide an output of virtual health guidance. And so deep neural networks are particularly suited for these kind of data sets where there are multiple hidden layers between the input and output layers, with the models being able to extract complex dependencies in the data 
and select features that are most relevant to predictions. And so another situation where this could be really useful is being able to predict biological age with the idea of inputting information from different biomarkers of age with the network using that information to accurately predict age. And so these networks are initially trained on current biological data and then to improve the accuracy this process is iterative in that the network can be improved over time so with more data to begin with the better the network can learn. To further improve the accuracy of the outputs, the inputs are also very important. And that includes not only what inputs are used, but also the quality of those inputs, with higher quality data inputs being desirable. And so that brings us on to the next couple of opportunities, which talk more about what these inputs are going to be. And so the next opportunity is routine clinical genomics to guide prevention, diagnosis and therapy. And so currently, genomics, so that means sequencing the DNA of an individual, is primarily limited to rare diseases and select cancers to make rational treatment decisions based on their genetic information. However, by 2030, the authors of this commentary predict that genomics will be routine, with genetic causes and targeted therapies being discovered for many common diseases, and also microbiome measurements being routinely included. In part, this will become possible due to the ever-declining costs in sequencing DNA. And the reason that this could be useful is that it's because all of us have different genetic variations, and this means that we could respond differently to different drugs. And so this is where pharmacogenomics comes in, which is effectively genomics-guided therapies that can improve drug efficacy, reduce adverse events, and also reduce cost by tailoring the therapy to the individual based on their genetic information. But this is just one layer of information, and so this leads on to the next opportunity, which is higher variety, higher resolution phenomics and environmental exposure data for both clinical and research use. So effectively, what this next opportunity is referring to is the continued growth of research and clinical uses for different ways to measure clinical phenotypes, exposures and lifestyle, and basically try to harness the pretty much unlimited biological, physiological, anatomical and environmental data that could be very valuable for improving the output data. And it's important to also note that the data for an individual is going to vary on a daily, weekly, seasonal, yearly basis. And more on from that, since the majority of our lives are spent outside the healthcare system, it's going to be the integration of wearable devices and other patient-provided information that are going to be able to augment this aspect. And going back to the example we used earlier of precision nutrition, it could be by 2030 that instead of using dietary assessments based on research surveys, instead data could be linked with grocery stores, digital uploads from restaurants, or machine learning applied to food imaging to provide more feasible, comprehensive capture of dietary habits. So where is all this information going to be stored for an individual? Well, this brings us on to the next opportunity, which is the use of electronic health records as a source of phenomic and genomic research. Now, electronic health records are not new and are already extensively used. However, at the moment, they're only episodic captures from healthcare without robust genomic support. Moreover, the data is pretty much not portable in terms of being able to integrate it with different health records. And so by 2030, the hope is that the electronic health records will not only be genome and device enabled, but that the data can be easily moved between electronic health records and to participants' apps. And so this brings us on to the last and what I think is probably the most important opportunity discussed in this article, which is privacy, participant trust and returning value. And so what this last opportunity is talking about is the fact that the utility of precision medicine very much depends on there being broad participation. But to have broad participation of a large population, it requires trust from individuals, protection of privacy and a return of value to those participants. And so in many ways, this is possibly one of the hardest challenges of achieving precision medicine, given the fact that science has not always been trustworthy or honoured all participants equally. So it's hoped that with increased transparency and authentic engagement with communities, this can improve trust and create participant advocates and ensure a more thoughtful, culturally sensitive direction. And in terms of being able to keep the data secure and private, it seems very likely that access control via blockchain and the use of hashed identifiers to be able to link the data and other encryption processes to be able to analyze the data will definitely play a key role. 
But there are still many other challenges that aren't addressed in this article. For example, it would be very important for there to be evidence that precision medicine is actually working. And for that to happen, we would need randomised controlled trials to show that the outcomes, in terms of the patient's health, has been improved by using these different approaches. And more on from that, it's important to be able to identify where there's false positives or so-called incidental findings, whereby these deep neural networks give abnormal readings. And so whilst we can come back to the point of improving the outputs by improving the quality of the input data, that doesn't necessarily solve the issue, given the fact that improving the measurement doesn't automatically lead to improved prognosis and diagnosis. For example, the introduction of the stethoscope was seen as a great advance due to the allowance for more precise detection and classification of heart murmurs among hospitalised patients. However, this led to problems when some individuals with detected heart murmurs were advised against doing physical labour and had to pay more for medical insurance without having established firm knowledge about the relation between such signs and symptomatic heart problems. And since most of these patients never developed heart problems, the example illustrates how introduction of prognostic technologies can unintentionally lead to harm if bodily signs are over-interpreted as indications of future disease. However, the iteration and update of these deep neural networks may be able to circumvent this. And then the final point to consider is to what extent does someone have control over the giving of their information and also the freedom in terms of acting upon the suggested advice? Now, I don't think there's any simple answers to these questions and ultimately they require much discussion but they should not be ignored as the development of precision medicine becomes closer. So all in all, there is much promise for precision medicine with real-time, accurate, predictive, valuable guidance to promote health span for each individual. However, as we've discussed, there are also many challenges to achieving precision medicine by 2030. So with that, I'd like to thank the sponsor for this week's video, Longevity Technology, for which I'm very grateful. Longevity technology deliver high quality daily news and insights on research, investments and technologies that extend health span and lifespan. Find the link to their website in the description. So I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.